All right, so kids are dismissed to uh, Sunday school, and uh, we are going through the Gospel of Luke. We're going to pick up in Luke chapter 18, and today we're going to read a couple of encounters that Jesus has uh, that are going to be interesting, and he's, he uh, sometimes is preaching and sometimes is healing and sometimes interacting and answering questions from the crowd. Uh, sometimes he's having to correct his own disciples, which we're going to see today. Uh, but in his responses, it's worth uh, listening. It's interesting and valuable to us even today because the evidence points to the fact that Jesus was in fact God himself in the flesh living among us and, and he teaches with authority, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees, that, that in the biblical account they realize there's something about the way Jesus talks that is different than, than anybody else. And, and Jesus teaches with full wisdom and experience. He is the God who was and is and is to come, that Jesus is the great I am. And so when he shares wisdom, with us. It's not something like we just put into a category of like, well, I guess that's interesting advice, or I'll just save that with the fortune cookie quote I've got on my fridge, or like, no, 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 like this is truth come to us to share with us, to, to bring about our flourishing. And he shares this truth from a perspective of eternity past and eternity future. He's not only mindful of what is healthy and good for us in this life, but also that which will be eternally beneficial for, for us and for generations to come. And so we're going to read some of these experiences, and it's always amusing uh, to see the followers of Jesus stumble and kind of screw up and do the wrong thing, and, and he corrects them, right? There's no church or group of believers you're ever going to find that are going to be perfect in everything they do. But fortunately, we hopefully all have our ears and our hearts open uh, that if Jesus would correct us, we would listen. Uh, so here we go, Luke chapter 18, verse 15. So he's, he's teaching, he's healing, there's a crowd, and the crowd, the people, these families start bringing even infants, these children to him, that he might touch them. All right, and so uh, we're going to find out the motive of these parents that are bringing their kids. It wasn't like, oh, look, a famous person. I want the famous person to have a picture with my kid. Like, that's not the motive that they had. They had a good, a good motive, but that's not the way Jesus' own ministry team perceived it. All right, that's not, they, they didn't think that these kids were important enough to interrupt Jesus' busy day. And so it says, when the disciples saw it, they rebuked these families, right? They're like, get out of here. Jesus doesn't have time for you. Like, this, he's very important. Like, this is not helpful. These kids might not even know how to talk yet. Like, get them out of here. They're in the way of Jesus and this important work that he's doing. And so, uh, embarrassingly, that's how the followers of Jesus responded, was sending away uh, these families and their kids. But, verse 16, Jesus called to the family saying, hey, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Verse 17, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And so we see Jesus, he uh, corrects his disciples, although subtly in this uh, account uh, in gospel, uh, the Gospel of Luke. He corrects his disciples and he invites these families, these kids to him. And he's like, hey, I've got time for this. This is important. This is valuable. Uh, please let them come to me. And we see that in Matthew's account, Matthew 19, of the, uh, describing the same moment, the same experience. Matthew actually says that in verse 13, the children were brought to him that he might lay hands on them and pray. Okay, and so the intent of the parents was they want Jesus to pray for their kids. This is a good thing. And then at the end of it, he does, in fact, lay his hands on them, and then they went away. And so what happens in this experience is, awkwardly, the disciples are trying to get rid of these kids. They're trying to get them away. They thought they would ruin the, the ministry and the important work that Jesus is doing. They thought they would get in the way. And, and now think about the mindset of Jesus. He's fully aware with, you know, about his mission, about why he was 
coming on the earth, about why he was sent to seek and save the lost, to give his life as a ransom for many, right? He is, as described and prophesied about in the book of Isaiah, to be a, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He's got like the burden of the world on his shoulders as he realizes he's going to completely pay the penalty for humanity's sin. And while he has all of this on his mind and, and, and his face, the, the Gospels describe his face is now set and fixed towards Jerusalem, he knows that he's going to the cross to die. He recognizes he's going to suffer at the hands of wicked men and experience this difficult death for humanity. And yet, Jesus, even though he's on like the most significant mission that's ever, ever happened, he's like, I've got time for this. I'm going to stop and bless these kids. He considers these kids to be worthy of his time. He doesn't look at them as any less important than the other people in the crowd. He's not just merely trying to rub shoulders with the influential. He's like, no, these kids are worth my time. They are made in the image of God and they are precious. Uh, they are, in fact, those who the kingdom of God are made of, he says. Like he, he elevates and esteems them to be of great value. And that Jesus, even though he's on this incredibly important mission, he says, I've got time for this. This is important. This is significant. This is what I need to be doing. This is pleasing to my Father if I do this right now. He considers children to be loved by their Creator and worthy of His investing in them. Now, in Mark chapter 10, He's a little bit more stern with His disciples in the same exact story, the same exact event. Uh, he doesn't just kind of like passively like invite families. In Mark 10, 14, it says, when Jesus saw his disciples rebuking these families and kids, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. And so Jesus was angry with his disciples, angry with his ministry team. Like, guys, you don't know, this is, this is, this is important. This is what we're about. This is why I'm here. This is something that I should be doing. Like, why are you sending them away? Like, do you even know what we're here for? Is kind of like what it seems like he's saying. And so we, uh, when thinking about this passage, you might be like, okay, Brian, so the life application is if Jesus visits town this week, and there's kids that are trying to get to Jesus, I won't rebuke the kids. Right? Like, that's what, like, you might think. But there's actually more to it than that. Luke uh, wrote this down. The other gospel writers wrote this down. The, the Holy Spirit inspired them. God, the Father, preserved His Word to benefit us. And even though Jesus no longer is acting in His earthly ministry in the capacity He was then, there's still a way that we need to be mindful. All right? There's still a way that we should be applying this type of truth to our lives, right? That we, we don't just think about like, okay, I'm not going to keep kids away from Jesus when he visits. Like that's not what we need to consider. We need to consider is what do we as parents and as a community, in what ways do we hinder our children from encountering the God who loves them? What, in what ways do I uh, create a stumbling block, perhaps, between my own kids and the Creator who calls them to life, the one who invites them to salvation and freedom? Are there any ways that in my life that I am somehow uh, sabotaging their future, uh, not that I'm fully responsible for every outcome in my kids' lives, but are there any ways that I'm... I'm putting a blockade, a wall, a barrier between them and God, that I'm misrepresenting the Father to them, that they wouldn't see Him in right light. And so that's what we're going to take a look at today. And the first thing that we uh, should realize is a helpful thing to, to not hinder children or the next generation from encountering Jesus is this, that we need to teach them about Jesus. All right? Actually teach them about Jesus, that this is a good thing that God expects us to do, that God wants us to do and desires us to do. He doesn't want us to be passive in that approach, just being like, I don't know, I, I don't want to push Jesus on them. Like, we'll just let them figure it out in their own time. Like, no, no, no. Teach your kids. Teach the next generation. Instruct your grandkids 
about Jesus. This is a good and worthy thing to do. In Ephesians 6, 4, it says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. All right, so there, there's another life lesson. That's a way you could hinder your kids. It's possible that even for Christian dads, that the way that they talk to their kids or correct their kids, that they could do it in a way that's provoking anger in them. All right, and so that's something that if, if as a dad, when, when we fail, right, we can repent of that and just be like, hey, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't do a great job there. Uh, please forgive me. But here's the other part that I wanted us to catch. It's this, bring them up in the discipline of the Lord, right? The instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in this way, that, that God is expecting us to be actively doing this work of, of leading them to Jesus, bringing them to the one who loves them more perfectly than we do, the one who has a plan for their life far better than our plan for their life. Actively be teaching your kids about Jesus, even, even when they're, they're grown up and adults, right? Be pointing to Jesus in everything that you do, right? God expects us to be spiritual leaders, that, that, that we are to teach them to love Jesus, the God who loves them, that we're teaching them to obey Jesus, that the things that he says are worth obeying, are, he's worth following, that we should raise them in a community of believers, that we ourselves when we gather in his name, we are equipped for every good work that God calls us to. And likewise, our children need that, that we can't be the sole uh, ones that invest in their spiritual future, that God intends each believer to be a part of a community as we grow together, that we grow into maturity towards Jesus, as we are growing in our gifts and growing in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Like these are things that we as adults need, that we need encouragement from one another, we need exhortation from one another, we need prayer from one another, and our kids need that experience as well. So this is the first idea. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And if this is true uh, for the way we make disciples, then it's also true for the way we raise our kids or the way we invest in kids in our community. Because Jesus said this in Matthew 28, Verse 19, you're probably familiar with this passage. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. All right, and so if, if Jesus thinks it's worth training adults, teaching adults about his word, uh, teaching us all to, to follow and obey him, to observe his commandments, then it's certainly likewise true for our kids. All right? It's certainly true for our kids, but we've got to be careful. It certainly isn't, uh, we don't want to present a false gospel to them either. That, that they're, and we'll get there, we'll see in this next encounter coming up shortly. Uh, we don't want to teach them a, a law keeping or a, a moral uh, ethic in which they think that that's the way in which they're saved, because that's actually really dangerous as well. But, but this is the first idea. Teach them about Jesus. All right? So, so this, uh, in contrary to kind of cultural practice, some, some people think like, no, no, I'm just going to let my kid kind of investigate a bunch of different world religions or whatever belief system they want, and I'll let them figure it out on their own. But I want to suggest that's actually like a snare and sabotage to our own children. All right, like uh, my other job, I'm a, I'm a public math teacher, right? Public school math teacher. And when I teach math, it's been found out for generations that, that we should teach them the true math. All right, like that there's a, a variety of statements that are true about algebra and number systems and geometry. And we've, as, as a society, determined it's better and more beneficial and to the flourishing of society if we teach our kids the truth. All right, when my students come to school, I don't like set before them like, I don't know, math can be whatever you want it to be. All right, I'm going to, like, you could just let math be the thing you'd like. Like, maybe you don't like math, right? Maybe you want to just have it, all these statements be, be true in some other way. You want it just to be the thing that you'd like it to. We don't do that. Right? There's plenty of false claims about mathematics. There's infinitely many ways to say a mathematically statement false when there are very few ways to say it correctly. All right? And so just like we don't do that in education, 
where we're just like, hey, here's a plethora, here's the truth, and then a whole bunch of lies. Pick what you'd like. We likewise shouldn't do that when we teach our kids about Jesus, all right? That, that's, that's not a kind thing to do to them, right? When you set a meal before your kids, you're not like, oh, five of these food items have been poisoned. Let's see what you figure out. Like, no, 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 that's not a kind thing to do to your kids, right? We as humans, we're going to stumble on our own as it is, but we should be intentional about teaching them the truth, okay? Uh, and so, so that's the first big idea. Uh, and, and one of the reasons this is important, like you're not like, well, I'm going to wait until they grow up and figure it out on their own. The enemy doesn't wait. We've seen in the biblical account, like Jesus cast the demon out of this kid, where this demon in this young child was throwing the kid into the fire and water trying to destroy the kid. All right, I want to point out, like there's an enemy at work on the earth who is actively against kids. He doesn't operate according to the Geneva Convention. He's not going to wait until the kid grows up. Like, he's actively working to deceive and attack humanity. And so it's important that we're not just passive in our instruction of our kids, that we're actually leading them towards the God who loves them. Here's here's another big deal uh, for us to consider. Uh, Don't teach them to believe in being a good person. And now this, that you might be like, well, wait a minute, like, don't I want to just spend all my time teaching my kid to be a good person? Like, isn't that what I want? Isn't that what Sunday school is about this morning? Like, they're probably learning something about one of the Ten Commandments or something, and, and like, we want our kids to just make morally good choices. We want our kids to do the right thing all the time. Like, Brian, why wouldn't I want my kid to just learn how to be a good person? Now, the problem is that it's mixed with this false doctrine, potentially, of legalism or this, this false doctrine of self-righteousness. And we actually read that last week from Jesus in sharing one of his parables about the Pharisee and the tax collector, that Jesus worked hard to correct this misunderstanding that, that we cannot look to ourselves, trust in ourselves for our own righteousness, that we can't attempt to do enough good that somehow we are made right with God or acceptable to God because of of the laws that we kept or the things that we did right. And so, so what's dangerous is sometimes, uh, you know, even biblical stories can be presented in such a way that it's like, hey, oh, the moral of the story is don't steal, right? The moral of the story is don't commit murder. Don't, don't be angry in a sinful way. Like, and and if, if we present the gospel in that way, the takeaway is like, okay, the Bible's got a bunch of maybe like heroes in it and and once in a while, like, there's these moral lessons that I'm supposed to take into my life, and that's how I please God, when that's not, in fact, the case. That's not how God is pleased. Uh, so here, check this out. Luke chapter 11:52. Jesus corrected this kind of false teaching in his own generation. He said, Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering that the way that some of these lawyers, these religious teachers in Jesus' day were teaching, they were, they were presenting this, this covenant of God as though that is the means through which you're justified. Rather than hoping in this coming Messiah, it was like, no, you just go and, and keep these feasts and, and eat the right way and, and do all of these things and keep the commands, and, and they'll even add a whole list of more commands for you to keep. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you're actually hindering people from experiencing God's gift of, of righteousness, that you're, you're getting in the way of them experiencing God's kingdom, that you're teaching this law-keeping, you're ignoring the idea of mercy and grace, and you're teaching this moral standard of self-righteousness. Now, Paul, right, this church planter in the New Testament, he ended up having to write a church and correct this exact kind of thinking, where the, there were Christian believers, followers of Jesus that were trying to revert back to law-keeping as a way to make themselves right with God. And this is what he said. And he, he does, Man, Paul, yikes, here we go. Uh, Galatians 5, chapter 2, he says this, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. 
And now when it says that, he's not talking about that physical act. He's talking about you are looking to that to be the means through which you are justified and made right with God. That's what Paul's describing here. He says if you think by keeping a religious tradition or by doing a particular set of laws that you're going to be made right with God, he says Christ is of no advantage to you. That what Jesus came to do is now made nullified and void in your life that if you're expecting your life to be uh, pleasing to God on account of how you live. In fact, he, he says that if you want to try to keep even one of the laws, now you're obligated to keep all of them. Like if you're seeking to be justified by law keeping in even one way, now you're obligated to do it for every single law. And we know that we don't do that very well, right? Like I don't want to be judged according to the law, because I fail to keep the law. Jesus, uh, actually Paul writes this, he says, you who would seek to do this are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, and so that's, that's the emphasis there. It's are you seeking this as a means to make yourself right with God? That you are actually cut away from Christ the moment you begin to trust in your own good works, your own uh, law-keeping as a means to be right with God. He says, you have fallen away from grace, and so you're judged according to the law rather than God's mercy and grace in your life. He says, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? And so what Paul's saying is like, if you came to Jesus from a Jewish background or you were a Gentile pagan and you came to Jesus, neither of those uh, heritages have anything to do with your relationship with God now. The, The way you have access to God is completely through faith that expresses and works itself out through love. All right, that's the way we have access to God. And then Paul, he uses the same word as Jesus, right? Don't hinder the kids from coming to me. Paul's saying, who showed up at church and is bringing you back under the burden of the old covenant law? Who's hindered you from obeying the truth? Because the law is not intended for a, the, to be the means through which we are justified. The Bible teaches that through the law comes the knowledge of sin, that through the law, it's supposed to be the, the means through which our hearts are diagnosed as needing healing. It's through the law that we recognize our need for forgiveness and our need for a Savior that we would place our hope in Him. But if I go to the law and I'm like, oh, I think I can do this, and like I'm going to get a checklist and, and here we go, like that's actually going to disappoint me. It's going to separate me from the grace that God wants to have be actively at work in my life. And what's interesting is this is exactly what happens next as Jesus is talking to the crowd and Jesus prays for these kids and these families end up going away and he talks about how you can't receive the kingdom unless you receive it as a child. Someone in the crowd comes and asks Jesus this question. And you might might be familiar with this person. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 18, it says this, And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? life. And when we combine uh, Luke's narrative with other gospel accounts, we find out that this person was not only a ruler, but they were also rich and they were young. They're typically referred to as the rich young ruler, someone who's incredibly successful in all of these ways. And we're going to find out he has this perspective of himself, that he is this good person. And he goes to Jesus and he's like, hey, I think Jesus is a good person as well. Good teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And immediately Jesus begins to dismantle this worldview of being a good person. All right, this is what Jesus said, verse 19. Why do you call me good? All right, now that's not that Jesus is disagreeing. He's he's interested in why have you called me good? He says there is no one is good except God alone. Why do you call me good? good. Are you identifying Jesus as God is essentially what he's asking, right? Or are you just 
think that you're a good person, I'm a good person. Oh, that's a great, that's a good guy over there. Like, you got to go meet that guy. Like, no, no, no. Like, Jesus is like, no one is good. No one. All right? No one is good except God. And Jesus would have agreed that he is, in fact, God and is good. But he's interested in what is this man believing? What is this man saying when he says, good teacher? And so Jesus asks, all right, because the man, the man had a, a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And this guy, when he's confronted with the law of God, his response is incredible. He says, Jesus, all of these I have kept since my youth. All right, and that's the wrong response to the law. All right, when we hear the law of God, we shouldn't be like, oh, I've got this. Like, here, watch this, Jesus. I'm going to do awesome at this. No, 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 no. The law should confront our hearts to the point where we're, where we're like, even though I might occasionally succeed, at least at not doing the external act of some of those things, like, I'm failing to keep these laws in my heart that my brain might dwell upon these things that are sinful and damaging to me and others. Like, I do, I do not succeed at keeping the law, right? That's the right response to the law. But this guy, he's like, you know what? Like, Jesus, I've, I've done it. Like, I'm good. I've got this. I am successful. I'm young. I'm rich. I have authority. I'm this ruler. Like, my life is together, and I'm trying to, I've kept all those laws. And Jesus, tell you what? extra credit. Give me one more. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? What would you say, good teacher? Because I've already done what the rabbis told me to. What do you say I need to do? Because I, I bet I can do that too. And so this is his perspective, and it's wrong thinking. He believes he is this good person. But now let's take it back into the realm of, of parenting and, and investing in our kids. When we read this story about this individual, we might think this guy's the hero. We might think this is who I want to be. This is who I want my kids to be. The one who's rich and successful and owns their own house, has started their own business, you know, got the scholarship for their sports and is now in college and whatever. Like we think that this is the kind of kid that we want. This, this is the kind of kid who does the right thing every time, right? We're like, this is awesome. Why can't my kids keep the law of God since they were children, right? Like, that's what I would want, but that's, in fact, not the case. This is not what you want for your kid. This is not what you want for your own life, where you are looking at yourself to be justified or made righteous on account of what you have done. And Jesus identifies that about this man. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, his, this man's own self-assessment of law-keeping, he said to him, one thing you still lack, right? One thing. I imagine going to Jesus and like, you're like, man, Jesus, I don't know how my life's going. And he's like, no, 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 you only miss one point. You're 99%. You're doing great. Like, how amazing would that be to hear Jesus say, you're only screwed up in one area. Wow. Like, I would love to hear that. But what's unfortunate for this man is it's the one thing that counts, that all of these other things mean nothing compared to this one thing that counts right? Like rich young ruler, like I'd rather to be old and poor and have no authority and have my life fallen apart and be failing to keep the law that I might have the one thing that Jesus wants me to have, that that is more meaningful, more powerful. I'd rather be, you know, struggling with drug addiction, pornography, whatever it might be, but have this one thing than have this superficially clean and successful life that this rich young man had because I don't want to miss out on the one thing that Jesus says matters. I don't want to miss out on the one thing. All right? This is what Jesus says. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the man heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Now Jesus had this, general instru or this instruction for this man's life where he says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That is not... God's command for all people, just so you're aware. All right, we see that is the case throughout Scripture, all right? But for some people, their stuff owns them more than they own it. And Jesus identified that in this man's life, it was idolatry. He was worshiping this life that he had made 
for himself. And freedom for this man meant giving that up, at least momentarily, that he could experience the life that God wants him to have. But notice, it might seem as though Jesus said two things when Jesus said he was only lacking one. But the thing that Jesus was inviting him to do was to follow him. Come, follow me. Come and follow me. This man wanted there to be like a single thing of like, all right, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Give me, give me just like one command, I'll do it, and then I know I'm good. But Jesus is like, no, it's not that easy. You need to follow me. That means whatever my instruction for your life might be throughout the rest of your life, that you're going to follow me and obey that instruction. It's not like a one thing that you can do that then you're, you're set. That's not the way that it works. And so Jesus identified the idol that this man worshipped, which was money. And Jesus is like, listen, I want freedom for you. I love you. I care for you. You've got to cut this out of your life for a moment that you could walk in freedom and experience the life that I want you to have. And so this man, he walks away weeping. And Jesus responds, verse 24, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It seems as though Jesus identified in this man that he had in many ways gained the whole world and at least in this moment had forfeited his soul. All right, that he's missing out on this blessing that Jesus has for him. It wasn't found in law keeping. It wasn't found in success. And even though we'd want this for ourselves and we'd want this for our kids, it's much more important that our kids encounter Jesus in a real and authentic way, that they know that there's grace available when they fail, when they stumble, right? That you're going to love them no matter what and that God loves them and pursues them as well and that that is the thing that's more important. Jesus says how difficult it is and I would suggest based on the other scriptures how difficult it is for those who think they are righteous to enter the kingdom of God, all right? Because we don't think we have a need to repent. We don't think we have a need for a Savior. We wouldn't think we'd need forgiveness. And it would be difficult for us to enter if we'd never acknowledge the need to humble ourselves. Jesus didn't come for the righteous. He came for sinners to call them to repentance, to invite them into a life of freedom. And so this is important. Don't teach your kids to believe in being a good person. Here's another idea. Yes, teach your kids about the self-deception of sin. All right, just because I don't want to teach my kids to be legalistic and law-keeping doesn't mean we'd want them to fall into the pit on the other side. All right, yes, teach your kids about how sin is self-destructive and self-deceptive. All right, it screws up adults. Like, don't teach your kids to live a life where they only chase after the things that they want because that's how foolish adults live where we... Paul describes them as their God is their belly. They're just going after the things that their bodies crave, and that's a foolish way to live, and you don't want your kid living a life that way. All right, so teach them not to be self-righteous, but also teach them to have a good boundary and barrier against sin in their life, that they wouldn't be seeking after the fleeting pleasure of sin. There's an account in the Old Testament about this priest, Eli, who's also operating as a prophet, and he has these sons that he never corrects. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, I'm just super summarizing this, it said this, now the sons of Eli were worthless men, they did not know the Lord. They end up doing all of these horrible things, abusing the authority that they'd had, and it said this, verse 17, that thus the sin of the young men was great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. In verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So that's like at church, okay? And, and Eli, instead of responding with correcting, he cared more about his kids' success, he cared more about them having a job than he did about the people of God, than he did about the Lord himself. 
Verse 23, it says, And Eli said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is, not, it is no good report that I hear from the people of the Lord spreading abroad. And sadly, Eli never corrects them beyond that. He at least brings their behavior into question, but he never did anything about it. And in the next chapter, the Lord brings a word of prophecy to this young boy, Samuel, in 1 Samuel 3.11. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I will declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever. For the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. And so what's unfortunate here is that Eli, when he parented his kids, he never corrected them. He never led them to God. He never told them, like, listen, you can't do this and there is a firm boundary here. And as a result, his, his lineage, his whole line ends up being cut off. All right, it's important that we teach our kids about the danger of sin because we make poor choices with sin. All right, we stumble and fail, but we want our kids to be on guard against the same things. Just like we would train our children to, to overcome laziness or to, to work hard in school or the importance of like eating healthy or brushing your teeth, and like even when they don't want to do those things, it's like, no, it's, this is still important. Like we're still gonna do this. All right, the same way, like there will be areas of our lives that as long as we have a human body, it will be at war with our spirit that we need to recognize that there will be things we desire that are contrary to the word of God that are not good for us, that are destructive to us, right? And we want to teach our kids to live in such a way that they are experiencing the grace that God has for them, but they also don't trample that grace underfoot by living as though what they do doesn't matter. Now, Another area for us to consider is that when we teach our kids, we should give them a reason for the hope that is in us. Give them evidence of the truth of the gospel, evidence of the resurrection. All right, uh, in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, and Peter is writing, he's instructing, talking about how we interact with the world. And he's, he says this, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And so when it comes to our own kids, we need to be able to have a reason for why we believe what we believe. We need to be able to give a, a legitimate claim, evidence for what we believe and why we believe it. We don't want to give them a simple or fickle answer of like, well, the Bible says it, or, you know, ju you just got to have faith. Like, if they have a difficult question, we need to study it out, maybe with them, and say like, I don't know the answer to that. Let's, let's look at this up together. Let's figure this out. We need to be able to have a reason for them, because if they think that, like, it's just like we randomly picked some book to believe and base our lives on, they're not going to follow it when it gets difficult. They'll set it aside when they'd rather pursue something else. We need to be able to give them evidence, right? That when they are trying to come to terms with these difficult questions or challenges they might have, we need to help them to see why believing the historical evidence of the Gospels is logical. We need to, to make sure that they come into, into, uh, into the knowledge of realizing that this world, God's creation, is saturated with information and specified complexity that points to the fact that it was made by a creator. And we need to point to the life of Jesus that there's evidence that he did in fact raise from the dead, that God in fact dwelt among us, and that's worth believing. It's a reasonable belief, and it's a transforming belief. And so we want to be able to give kids a reason for the hope that is in us, but even more important than the reason, we need to have that hope in us to begin with, right? We can't teach our kids the things that we don't know or lead them down a path of life that we don't follow, right? We need to be examples to our own children that we would demonstrate 
in the way that we live, what it looks like when we stumble and when we repent, what it looks like to acknowledge that we're only made right through Jesus, what it looks like when my life is falling apart, but we're going to trust God even in the midst of storms, right? We need to be able to live a life of hope for our children, right? That they would see someone who loves God and pursues God and is seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, Because if we live as though this is, meh, not that important, they're not going to deem it very significant either, right? We need to live a life where we acknowledge who we are, right, where we failed, that we need to repent, right, that we apologize to our spouse when we fail or our kids when we stumble or we, we own up to the things that we've done wrong, we stay true to our word, right, that we live a life that's actually following Jesus. And even if we don't have the success of that rich young ruler, we have the one thing that counts. And it should be evident to to our children in the way that we live that this is the most important thing. And so Luke 18, 16, Jesus, when he'd finished that phrase, (coughs) that encounter about those kids needing prayer, Jesus called them saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And so what Jesus indicates is that we don't enter his kingdom on our own merit. We don't enter his kingdom on our own good works. In fact, we are like a small child who has maybe minimal things that we can do or benefit a household with. We're we're not bringing resources in to the household. We have nothing to bring to God when we come into his family, right? But we can receive his kingdom like children, that we can have a childlike faith where we can believe like, God, I've got nothing to offer you, but I need you. I need your mercy. I need your grace. And I'm willing to follow you where you would lead. Like, this is the kind of thing that Jesus invites us to. We can't come into his kingdom prideful and and looking at our own accomplishments and our own achievements. We need to be humble, and he will exalt us. Right? If we acknowledge that we have sin, if we confess that he is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We will experience mercy and forgiveness. We will be gifted his righteousness in exchange for, for our own sin, right? That's the way we come into the kingdom of God. It's with a childlike faith. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that God wants us to be childish, right? He wants us to grow and mature as Christians, that we would grow in his gifts, that we would grow in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that we would continue to be nourished by his word and by gathering together as a body of believers that we would mature and become more and more like Jesus every day as we follow him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have such a low barrier of entry uh, to get into your kingdom. And the only thing that becomes a stumbling block is whether or not we're willing to humble ourselves, whether or not we're willing to recognize that we can't do it on our own. I thank you, Lord, that your mercy is astounding, your grace is amazing, that while we were still sinners, you showed your love for us by dying for us. I pray, God, that you would stir up in us a reminder of who we are when we are found in you, that we no longer have to experience shame or condemnation, that we can come before your throne of grace, that we can boldly come before you because you invite us in not because of what we've done, but because of what you have done for us. I pray, God, that if there are idols in our hearts, that, Lord, we this morning would be willing to set them aside in our pursuit of you. That, Lord, we would find hope in you, joy in you as we experience your salvation, as we follow you in your kingdom. That even in areas of our lives where it will be difficult for us to obey, I thank you that in that obedience we find great joy and great blessing as we seek after you. I pray, God, that you would equip us for every good work and that, Lord, you would help us to teach and train up the next generation this great responsibility that you've given us, that we would point them towards you and not towards self-righteousness or not towards a fleeting pleasure of sin. 
And I thank you, God, that you love us. You receive us as children. And Lord, we are found brand new, made new in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.